And we are so pleased to have with us Jeremy Scahill, the author of, actually, you can take a full screen, there you go, of Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield, New York Times bestselling author of Blackwater, and uh, for our Conversations with Great Minds series. Jeremy, welcome. I don't know that my mind is that great, but I'm honored to be with you, Tom. Your, your mind is that great. And, and Blackwater was a brilliant book, in this, and you've outdone yourself with Dirty Wars. Uh, this, this is really an extraordinary piece of work. Thank you. Let's, let's start out with just the, the title of the book, Dirty Wars. Why? Why that word? Why that phrase? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't trying to be a master of the obvious. I mean, we all, anyone who's, who's you don't even have to have covered a war to know that, that all wars are dirty. But I, I, it was sort of a response to the notion that's been put forward by some members of the administration that the Obama administration is somehow waging a clean war, that our drone strikes are just taking out the bad guys and that the number of civilians killed has sort of been minimal. But mm -hmm. what was more important to me about it is uh, as a kind of reference to a, uh, a series of dirty wars that, that you yourself covered uh, extensively and have written about, and that was what the U.S. was doing in Central America in the 1980s, right. uh, in El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, yep. where we were getting in bed with right-wing dictatorships, or we were funding uh, you know, death squads in the form of the Contras, um, and involved and, and all the, sorts and, of covert and action. And the 50s and 60s in the Middle East. Right. In the 50s and 60s in the Middle East and in Africa as well. Yeah. I mean, you had the the uh, the murder of Patrice Lumumba in, yep. in, in Congo, and, and you had the overthrow of Salvador Allende. Yeah. Uh, one of the first things the CIA did, of course, was in 54, overthrow Jacobo Arbenz. And uh, and so, you know, With what ITT. I'm saying... And, right, exactly, yeah. right. So, you know, what I think we've seen under President Obama is that he really has tried to get us completely out of Iraq. I mean, there is a, a residual strike force and a CIA presence, and I'm concerned about that. Afghanistan, he says he's going to draw it down uh, in 2014. Um, but I think what we're going to start seeing is more of this covert action, the small footprint approach. And, you know, we're using warlords in Somalia right now, working with proxy forces in Yemen and elsewhere, and an expansion of uh, robotic warfare, drone, drone warfare. And that is bad because... Well, I, th I think that, you know, you can look at it through two lenses. One is uh, you can look at it purely through the perspective of U.S. national security. And I, I, what I would say from my experience on the ground in a number of these countries is that we are creating more enemies than we are killing actual terrorists plotting against us. I I'm very clear in my book and in my personal life, there are people that want to do harm to the United States, that want to bring down our aircraft or send packages to... Jewish community centers. I mean, these plots are real. Mm. Um, my issue is, if we respond to those threats, which are relatively small compared to many of the threats facing us as a nation, I think our economic situation is, and our, our environmental uh, health, those are two of the major actual security sure. threats facing us. But if you look at what we're doing um, in the pursuit of a, of, of a relatively small group of people that want to do harm to us or to kill Americans, I think we're actually increasing the likelihood that such attacks will happen, because I think we're uh, expanding the number the, the number of people in countries where these plots could uh, emanate from. Um, so just on a tactical level, I think it's not a good idea. On a bigger level, I think that we are engaged in actions where we are targeting people that we don't actually have any intelligence on. We don't necessarily know their identity. We're classifying them as militants or terrorists based on their age, the region of the country that they live in, and people that they might be in contact with these things called signature strikes. Mm -hmm. For me, the big issue is going to be blowback and uh, and how it's going to harm us. And may already be, actually. With the, uh, it looks like the Boston terrorists uh, or the Boston bombers or whatever that you call it, you know, call these guys, that one of them was motivated by our war in Iraq. Right. And and yeah. if that turns out to be true, yeah. you know, I, I, I think it would be part of, of a, a pattern that I think we're going to see unfolding more um, as these wars go on. But I, I also have to say, a lot of the cable news outlets have been so systematically irresponsible with how they've reported on this story. I mean, right. clearly, anyone that would do something like that is either a fanatic or, or, or a, a seriously deranged individual, right. um, just like the people that go in and shoot up our schools are very deranged. So we, you know, it's good to study. We, it's important to study who these people are. But we, have we not learned the lesson from what happened after bin Laden was killed, where John, almost everything John Brennan said turned out to not be true, you know, right. about bin Laden using his wife as a human shield. But I'm very concerned that we're going to have people with a legitimate score to settle against us trying to attack us in retaliation for a drone strike or something else, and not just because, you know, America is the great Satan, but yeah. actually because they have some skin in the game. They've lost family members or been bombed. The metaphor I was using back in 2002 and 2003 was... Uh, when when uh, the Taliban offered to give bin Laden to a third country for trial and prosecution if the United States would produce any evidence that he had anything to do with 9-11, and we apparently had some evidence or we wouldn't have been calling him out for it, 
um, that you know we should have done that. We should have we should we should have said fine, thanks, we'll take him. You know, shut down his camps. That's you know you can go about being the Taliban in Afghanistan because this is a country with a GDP of two billion dollars a year. You know, a gross domestic product, two billion dollars a year, and we're spending like fifteen, twenty billion dollars. You know, a month. I see. So you know, yep. in this, it, it, this is insane. I mean, this is just plain old flat out insane. And that had we treated nine eleven as a crime done by a deranged criminal and a small sect of a large and noble religion. That that large and noble religion, I think, would be with us right now. I mean, there were candlelight vigils in downtown Tehran, Iran, the day after 9-11. Right. And, yes. and, and we, we had such an opportunity. And instead, George Bush just turned this thing, this war on terror. And now the Obama administration is, to, to a certain extent, I mean, he's trying to, he doesn't use the phrase war on terror. I, mean, I think he's done Global some, contingency you know, operations yeah, is what yeah, they're calling it. Right. right. Um, I mean, you know, he, he genuinely tried, apparently, to close Guantanamo, and Congress said, no, we won't give you the money to do it. We won't let you do that. These guys are, no, are, no. are they're, it's, they're kryptonite, you know, and it's a, <laughs> and we're, you know, James Inhofe, I'm Superman, and we can't let kryptonite get near Superman. Um, uh, but uh, we have created this idea of the war as a battle, or the yeah, world as yeah. a battlefield. I mean, the subtitle of your book, The World as a Battlefield. And I, I, you know, that wasn't my, uh, that's not my phrase. I mean, that that actually was a quote from someone who works on these covert operations. He said, the world is now a battlefield. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually stems from a military doctrine called operational preparation of the battle space, which R Donald Rumsfeld really tried to exploit. And, th and that, it basically says, if the U.S. military determines that there could be future hostilities in a country around the world, they can forward deploy troops, and there's very minimal oversight of the operations because it's preparing the battle space. And 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 Rumsfeld and Cheney had this vision, as did the neocons, that we can just declare the world a battlefield, and anywhere where terrorists reside, we can go hunt them down and take them out. And the Obama administration has updated and expanded some of those, what, what were called uh, AQN execute orders, Al-Qaeda network execute orders. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, in late 2009, when, when David Petraeus was the commander of CENTCOM, he issued a series of orders that authorized U.S. forces to start striking in, um, in Yemen and elsewhere in his area of responsibility. And that's when you saw the Obama administration start bombing it. I, I also want to say that I think that I don't believe that President Obama is this sort of nefarious villain in his lair plotting to zap up all of the world's resources and steal them. I think that, that the folks that are running the U.S. counterterrorism operations actually believe that what they're doing is going to keep Americans as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, I think they've bought into the briefings that they've been presented with by the CIA and by the military, uh, by Admiral McRaven, by the folks that have been at the CIA for a very long time. And I think that President Obama had very little foreign policy experience, and I think he was very, very much seduced by the special ops world because he saw these guys as this incredible elite force. It wasn't mm -hmm. even a, a, a counterterrorism operation that I think first opened President Obama's eyes to the power of the Joint Special Operations Command. It was when the Maersk, Alabama was seized off the coast of Somalia, hmm. which was this huge uh, ship that was a uh, uh, owned by a defense contractor. And I mean, you know this history better than I do, but I believe it was the first time that a U.S. flagged vessel had been hijacked in international waters in over 100 years. Since, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so the SEALs went in and they took down those pirates. And um, after that, President Obama had Admiral McRaven into the White House. And from there, their relationship was solidified and he started expanding their base of power. Remarkable. We're talking with Jeremy Scahill, his new book and soon a movie of the same title, right? That's uh, what I hear. Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. We'll be right back. 